Existence in a way is a play of these five elements. So Buddha Shuddhi is about cleansing these five elements within the system. How these five elements behave within me will determine the quality of who I am. Based on this, the basic form of yoga is just Buddha Shuddhi. Everything else is an outcrop of that, thought in various bits and pieces by many people without understanding the whole the homogeneity of what it is. But essentially it's about taking charge of the five elements. You practice Bhuta Shuddhi for a certain period of time and you achieve what is called as Bhuta Siddhi. That means you have total control over the five elements. To such, such an extent, there is any number of incidents where at the time of death or at the time of leaving their body, a yogi goes into a room, people lock it from outside, he goes in, and after a few days they open and he's just not there because he dematerializes himself. He doesn't want to trouble you with the funeral. He doesn't want anybody to carry him to the grave. Years ago I announced one program for the first time, ninety-day program. Why ninety days is? Approximately between forty to forty-eight days. The system goes through a certain cycle on the elemental level. This is called a mandala. Every forty to forty-eight days there is a cycle where the system goes through this cycle. So this is the reason if you go to any Ayurvedic doctor or a Siddha Vaidya, he will always give you a medicine for forty days or forty-eight days to make use of that cycle, natural cycle in the body. Now your body is over seventy percent water. If the, if the water in this system behaves in a sweet manner, will you be at least seventy percent sweet? Space is never bothering anybody, isn't it? <laughs> so, the, es the essential science of yoga is about Bhuta Shuddhi, taking charge of the elements within the system. Once you have control over the Sadhguru suggests you need to take sufficient care of the water that you consume, not just in terms of its physical purity, it being bacteria-free and so on, but in terms of how you keep the water and how you approach it. There is substantial scientific evidence today that a thought, an emotion, a touch can change the molecular structure of water without changing its chemical composition and greatly alter the way water behaves within your system. The same water can become poison or the elixir of life depending upon the memory it carries. Water and Consciousness Sadhguru suggests that water has a memory and can be influenced by consciousness. He emphasizes the importance of intention and source when consuming water, linking it back to traditional practices of using specific vessels. The right way to drink Water, Sadhguru has spoken about the importance of mindful hydration, advising against chugging large amounts at once. He suggests a more conscious approach to ensure proper absorption. Excessive water consumption Sadhguru cautions against overhydration, believing it can dilute electrolytes and disrupt bodily functions. The special significance of certain waters. In some talks, Sadhguru acknowledges the cultural and spiritual significance of particular bodies of water like the river Ganges in India, attributing unique qualities to their source and flow or reality Ganga's water have special significance. Life can become a real horror if certain things do not function properly and taking care of water is an important aspect of that. This is in place when we have no respect and reverence for that, how they behave within us is very different. Today there is substantial scientific evidence to show that water has tremendous memory. If you just generate a thought looking at the water, the molecular structure of the water will change. Just a look, the molecular structure of the water will change. If you touch it, it will change. How you touch it is very important. So now for example, they're keeping it in a copper vessel with a flower on top of it, because this is the god. What other god? If you don't drink water for one, one day, this is the only god. No other god, <laughs> isn't it? So how you treat the water, the memory remains for a long period. So before we consume it or before it touches our body, how we treat the water changes the quality of everything in our system. 
This is a science we have always known, but today modern science has done enormous amount of experimentation on this. Now they're saying, water is a liquid computer. The volume of memory and intelligence is carries by itself. It is a liquid computer, this is what they're saying, it's a fluid computer. We have always known this. What is called a stirth, why for one drop of water people go and stand in a temple, is because it has the memory of the divine. You want to take that into your system. If the deity is powerful and the water has touched the deity, it has the memory of the divine, you want that to enter your system. There are infectious diseases and chronic ailments. Infectious diseases are an invasion from outside. Other organisms are entering our body and troubling us. For this you need a doctor. But over seventy percent of human ailments are self-help. We manufacture that within our system. This is simply because fundamentally the way we are treating the elements within ourselves and around ourselves. The so-called modern life has absolutely no reverence to the substances which make our life. The life-making material is being treated badly and we're expecting it'll behave well within us and it will not. So being here at Narmada, it's time we bring back this culture because it's gone a full circle. Now modern science is insisting that water, the way you treat it is the way it's going to behave within you. And we must learn to treat it well. One simple thing you could do is how you treat the water, at least the water that you consume. I know today everybody is drinking water from plastic bottles. If you keep it in a metal vessel, particularly copper or copper alloy, the very nature of the water will change. And uh, traditionally, I don't know if it's still maintained in this part of the country, but in southern India, even now it's pretty common in traditional homes where every day there is a puja for the water vessel. They will put some vibhuti on it, some kumkum on it and there's a small arati for the thing because the water should Water has an enormous amount of memory, it remembers how you have treated and accordingly it will behave. This is something very simple, everybody can start. And as a part of this in Tamil Nadu, we have been encouraging people to use copper vessels, pure copper vessels, where because copper is such a… you know, it's, it's the best conducting metal and it energizes the water. Energizing, if you check the… I mean, if you check the chemical position, it will not change. That is the beauty of it. It's only the molecular structure of the water that will change. You might have experienced this. Suppose you ever… is there a waterfall in Narmada anywhere? There's a waterfall. If the water is falling like, let's say, over twenty, twenty-five feet, and just after the waterfall, if you just touch the water, you will find water is silky for touch. Have you noticed this? because water implodes within itself and the molecular structure changes. The way it feels is different. Today, they have created what is called as impl water imploding machines. You can implode the water with a machine, it just churns it in a certain way and implodes it. It has been found that if you use water imploding machines, with ten percent of the water, you can grow the plants the same way as you're growing the water consumption will come down. With ten percent of water, the plants will yield the same because the imploded water becomes silky and its ability to become a part of the plant system or tree is much, much better. So, for daily consumption, just a copper vessel, every day if you have something, if you light a lamp next to it, if necessary, just one flower, the very way the water behaves within you will change. And when before you consume just one… one moment of gratitude and reverence, because this is the material with which you're making your life, not with some unknown God, this is the material that makes your life every moment. And how you treat it is very important in your emotion, in your thought, if you hold water as… if you… you don't even have to think Devi, stuff. You just understand the reality, the fact of it is, without it you cannot survive, yes?
whatever is the basis of your survival, you bow down, isn't it? So the whole system of yoga is only focused towards enhancing your perception. If your perception is enhanced, something more, you don't have to look for it. It is happening in such proportions, you have to learn. In Sadhguru's teaching, he suggests how to drink water the right way. One, treat water with reverence. Traditionally, in the East, no one drinks water without first bowing down to it because how the water behaves depends on how you treat it. The volume of memory and intelligence that every molecule of water carries is very individual and how it behaves within you is very different. It may all be just water, but it does not behave the same way. Just spend one moment of gratitude and reverence before you consume water because this is the material with which you are making your life. The fact is that you cannot survive without it. So you bow down to whatever is the basis of your survival. If you treat these elements properly, unless you catch an infection, you most probably will not need to see a doctor's face. 2. Drink water with your hands The best way to drink water is with your own hands. If that is not possible, if someone gives water to you in a metal tumbler, you always hold it with both your hands and drink it. Have you seen this? Indian villagers still do it like that. It is important that before you drink water, you touch it first, allow that much time and then drink it. Then it behaves differently. 3. Drink water at the right temperature Today, a lot of people drink water with three-fourths of the tumbler full of ice cubes. In the yogic culture, if you are on the path of inner transformation and want to transform your system to another dimension of possibility, then you only drink water which is within 4 degrees of your body temperature. That is, your normal body temperature is somewhere around 37 degrees centigrade, so you can drink water between 33 and 41 degrees. If you are a student who is only interested in absorbing knowledge and not looking for transformation, you must drink within a variation of 8 degrees. If you are a householder who is not interested in any transformation or learning, but just want to manage your wife or husband and children, you can drink within a 12 degree variation. Beyond that, it is not considered conducive for anyone. No. Even if an ant crawls upon this hand, you can feel it. So much blood flowing, can you feel it? In the very nature of things, sense organs are outward bound. But everything that you experience happens within you. Right now, a simple question. Do all of you see me at least? Please use your hands and show me where am I? You got it totally wrong. You know I'm a mystic <laughs> Now this light is falling upon me, reflecting, going through your lenses, inverted image in the retina. Don't you know the whole story? So where do, where do you see me? Where am I right now? Within you. Where do you hear me? Within you. Where have you seen the whole world? Within you, isn't it? Have you ever experienced anything outside of you? Have you? Have you? Right now, you just touch your friend and see, you don't feel his hand. You will only feel the way your sensations are. You cannot experience his hand, please know this. You can only know the way your sensations are. You have never experienced anything beyond this. Everything that's happened to you, your joy and misery has happened within you, light and darkness has happened within you, just everything happens within you. But do you have a means to look inward? No, right now. So that will not happen unless you strive. It happened one day, someone came looking for Isha Yoga Center in South India, to a nearby village. They came and asked a local boy, how far is Isha Yoga Center? The boy said, it's twenty-four thousand nine hundred and ninety-six miles. What, that far? He said, yes, the way you're going, if you turn around it's four miles. <laughs> so right now, everything that you have is outward bound, but everything that's happening is happening within. So it gives you a completely false perception of what it is. So turning within will take a little bit of striving. So the whole system of yoga is only focused towards enhancing your perception. If your perception is enhanced, something more, you don't have to look for it. It is happening 
in such proportions, you have to learn to handle it. Big things will happen. First, are you alive? Yes. Next, are you awake? How awake? Awake enough. Awake enough to hear what I say. Awake enough to see where I am sitting. Awake enough to know that this many people are around you. Yes? So through your five sense organs, you are perceiving right now. Because you are at a certain level of wakefulness, you are perceiving what is around you. At least the physical around you. Suppose you feel little drowsy, what's happened? Your wakefulness has come to a lower grade. Because your wakefulness has come to a lower grade, do you see I am talking but you are not perceiving? Yes or no? Ears are still open, isn't it? Nobody plugged it. Sound is definitely going and hitting the eardrums, isn't it so? What I speak is anyway going and hitting the eardrums or no? It is, but still you are not perceiving because your wakefulness has gone one level lower than what it is right now. So if it can get lower, you can also get it higher, isn't it, logically? So if your wakefulness move into higher and higher dimensions, if it has to get there, you have to crank up your energy. Oh, excuse me. Duh. Is there a toilet nearby? Quickly, do you mind? I'll go. Yes. Okay. Hey. Is it nearby? It is, right into the green room, right into the green room. <laughs> <laughs> If your energy, life energy moves into higher levels of intensity, your wakefulness moves into higher dimensions of wakefulness. As your wakefulness moves into higher levels of dimensions, higher dimensions, your perception becomes clearer and clearer and the penetration of your perception deepens. Once the penetration of your perception deepens, it changes the very quality of your experience. Now if you try to raise your wakefulness, it will not happen. If you try to increase your perception, it will not happen. If you try to widen your experience, it will not happen. The only thing that is in your hands is, you can crank up the intensity of your life energies. You can only work on raising the voltage. If you raise the voltage, all these other things will naturally happen. It is an unpopular thing to say, but it is important that whatever you consume is somewhere in the range of the body temperature. Otherwise, it will disturb the way the water within the system behaves. I know the ice cream loving people will scream at me now, but I am just telling you the ideal conditions. How much water to drink? If you do not feel thirsty and do not drink water, you will be fine. Nowadays, people are carrying a bottle and sipping continuously because the marketing machines have done this to them. When you drink excessive water, especially in small sips, the body absorbs it. If you drink lots of water in one go, the body will decide how much to absorb and how much to throw out. But if you keep sipping throughout the day, the body gets deceived and tends to absorb more water than it should. Now the delicately balanced sodium levels will drop. In the brain, dropping sodium levels will lead to swelling of the brain. The rest of the body is also affected, but it may not be so noticeable this swelling does not mean your brain is growing. Swelling is a kind of sickness. Because there is not enough sodium, more water goes into the brain trying to supply the required sodium to keep the balance. More water in your brain means you will slosh and psychological imbalances will happen. When you feel thirsty, you must drink water. Just to ensure that you are drinking enough, drink 10% more than what you actually need. If you are not the kind who is carrying a water bottle with you every minute of the day, then it is good to drink a little extra water. Then when the need to drink comes, but you have to wait a certain amount of time before you can drink, it will not be an emergency. At the same time, when you are thirsty and need water but do not drink, it will cause damage to the system. It is very necessary that you must drink water when there is an indication of thirst. When the body indicates you need water, you must give it water within 20 minutes or at the most half an hour, the body will choose how much to take and how much to reject. Eat water. It is not just about drinking liquid water, you must eat high water content foods. If you eat a fruit, it is nearly 90% water. Vegetables are over 70% water. Your food must have a minimum of 70% water content. If you eat food with very low water content, it goes and gets stuck in your stomach like concrete. If you eat dry food, 
and then drink water it does not work when you consume food it must be at least level with the percentage of water content in your own body this is why vegetables and fruits must be a part of your diet fruit has nearly 80 to 90% water which is why it is the best thing to consume enormous in the yogic systems there is enormous focus on the pineal gland you know you know the pineal gland for a long time the modern medicine almost ignored it they said the there are so many things in this body which we are not bothered about it's because it's not concerned about day to day health situations today the maximum that they have come to is they are beginning to say the secretions of the pineal gland if they are on if they are active there will be no mood swings in you that's not the point there is a whole system of yoga to activate the pineal gland if you activate this and if it generates sufficient amount of secretion you will be ecstatic every moment of your life no see technology is a fallout unfortunately in this world nobody would fund science if it did not spin technology which is a very unfortunate thing because human intelligence wants to know it need not be useful it simply wants to know so technology is useful and what is useful today tomorrow you may realize is very destructive it may take away our life science must happen rampantly mysticism must happen rampantly because this is simply exploratory this is not about seeing how to make it useful but today modern science has become a slave of technology if you don't make it useful nobody is going to fund you anymore if you simply say i want to know nobody is interested in this how can it be turned into an enterprise that's all they are interested in this is a wrong way to approach science because science is a is is a fundamental need within a human being wanting to know it's the nature of human intelligence science is trying to achieve everything through physical means by taking physical quantities going by the physical laws but physically is like the peel of the fruit it has no purpose of its own the peel is useful only as a protective layer to the fruit once the fruit is eaten peel goes to the trash can right now the fundamental flaw in this approach is though it's produced phenomenal results in terms of well being for us comfort for us convenience for us the kind of comfort and convenience we're enjoying no other generation ever has known on this planet this is a fruit of science or technology rather in spite of that will it lead to human well being that's a question mark comfort and convenience will come but will well being come that's a question mark because if you look back on the humanity let's say 100 years ago or 1000 years ago how people were and how people are you today are you more joyful than them are you more blissed out than them <laughs> so are you more blissed out than previous generations it's not true we are in much more comfort but we are not in much more joyful states or pleasant states within ourselves or in essence our well being or the fundamental quality of our life has not changed though the physical quality of our life has changed like unimaginable proportions in the last 50 years so we are trying to approach everything through physical means if you go through physical means you will hit the glass wall somewhere i think in my perception i am not a scientist i don't know all of it but in my perception i think the physics are near the glass wall they might not have hit it they are near did you know that in our galaxy alone there are over 500 million planets capable of supporting life that just makes no fucking sense i mean this is bullshit my 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 you cannot disagree that your life are you you're a piece of life i am a piece of life everybody is what kind of personalities we have acquired what kind of likes and dislikes we have acquired what kinds of gods and demons we have acquired what kinds of other things we have acquired is a social process that's happened to us cultural and social process if you were born in a different part of the world it would be entirely different depending upon what we are exposed to these are impressions that we have taken in phenomenal amount of impressions leaving that aside let's look at one fundamental whatever you gather 
you can only claim it's mine, you cannot say it's me, isn't it? I can say this is my chair. If I sit here every day and then I say this is me, then there's a problem. I think there's a possibility… See, human intellect and human intelligence has broken out of a certain bond which was there for every other creature that they could function like an automated machine through certain instinctual process. What has happened with the human being with the process of evolution is, he's… the human being has broken out of that instinctual process and there is an intelligence which has to function consciously. But functioning consciously means every moment of life is an exploration, which is too scary for a whole lot of people. So the best thing is identify with something which gives you some sense of what you are. But this some sense of what you are which you took on… Sadhguru highlights the traditional wisdom of storing water in a certain way and offers benefits of drinking water from a copper vessel. Sadhguru have been encouraging people to use pure copper vessels because copper is one of the best conducting metals and it energizes the water. If you check the chemical composition of the water, it will not change. Only the molecular structure of the water will change. If you keep water in a copper vessel overnight or for about six hours and then drink it, you will see that the water will feel very different and various small ailments that people have can be just healed simply by keeping the water in an appropriate space. An appropriate space also means proper aeration and above all, your thoughts and emotions about the water, being conscious that this is a major ingredient of who you are right now. Water is not a commodity, it is life-making material. I have seen many people walking out of chronic ailments just by changing the water that they drink and how they drink. Material of the Container Traditional practices often recommend storing water in copper vessels. Copper has natural antibacterial properties that can help kill harmful microbes. This can be beneficial, especially in areas with unreliable water sources. Consciousness and Intention Sadhguru believes our thoughts and intentions can influence water. Storing water in a clean, dedicated container treated with respect can potentially improve its quality. Cost Effectiveness he discourages buying expensive, often plastic, water containers. These can be difficult to clean properly, leading to bacterial growth. Traditional vessels like copper pots can last a lifetime with proper care. Here's a breakdown of Sadhguru's perspective. Traditional wisdom. He advocates for using materials like copper, known for their natural cleansing properties. Cleanliness and maintenance. Traditional vessels often require regular cleaning to maintain their effectiveness promoting good hygiene practices. Avoiding harmful materials. He discourages using plastic containers which can harbor bacteria and may leach chemicals into the water. Cost effectiveness. Traditional vessels are often more affordable and durable than commercially marketed options. In essence, Sadhguru highlights the benefits of using well-maintained natural materials for storing water, promoting a more sustainable, and potentially healthier approach. Bigger body, this is how human identities go. But any identity limits you. It takes away the fundamental possibility of what this life is. Identity is required for survival process to manage day-to-day -day situations, but it is not an exploratory process. What is right now binding you to your body is your breath. If I take away your breath, your body will fall down, isn't it? You and your body will get separated if I just take away your breath. So one way of understanding breath is to see it as a thread which binds you and your body. On one level, all yogic practices are devised. Whatever you may be doing, fundamentally it is devised to make you experience, I am not the body. I am not the mind. Because whatever kind of suffering you have, whatever kind of problems you have with life, it's either of the body or of the mind, isn't it so? Yes? Do you have any other problem? 
Any other kind of suffering have you known? It's just either of this or that. So various methods are employed to bring you to a living experience. If you think I am not the body, if you think I am not the mind, it is not enough. When life threatens you, you will see all your thoughts will disappear and you will <laughs> react the way you will have to react. But if it's a living experience for you, if you sit here, you have a clear experience, I am not this. Then the very perspective with which you perceive life is very different. If you are sitting here and you know experientially, like right now you know that you are here, you simply know that I am not this, not because you are thinking. See, what you know by thought is different, what you simply know is different. Do you know the difference? Yes? What you have accumulated and think about is knowledge, it is not knowing. Knowing is simply you know that you are here. <coughs> you don't have to think that I am here, isn't it? Yes? You know that you exist, you don't have to think that I exist. Though somebody said I exist because I am thinking. <laughs> it doesn't matter, European philosophy. <coughs> In your experience, whatever you simply know, that is a reality. Thought is not reality because today your thoughts will say one thing, tomorrow they will say something totally different. If you have an evolving mind, you will see at different stages in your life, your thought has made you believe this is it. Tomorrow it will make you like a fool for believing what you believe today. Has it happened to you? Only if you are stuck in your head, all your life you got the same thought. If you have an evolving mind, every other day your thought will come up with something new and make you like, feel like a fool for what you thought yesterday, isn't it? So, your thought is not dependable. It is useful if you know how to use it, but it's not dependable if you're seeking to know what is true. So, ditch those fancy and often pricey plastic bottles. There are natural, cost-effective ways to store water that might even improve its quality. Do your research, find what resonates with you and let your body be the judge. Stay hydrated, stay informed and we'll see you on the next one. Remember, true well-being starts with the water you drink. Explore traditional wisdom and find what works for you. Until next time, Namaste.